So I am Cindy Cullen, and I am a freelance developer. How many of you guys are freelancers or want to be freelancers? Cool. <laughs> cool. There's not many of you in here, so this is going to be really informal. So stop me as you have questions or uh, want to know anything. So I guess my story sort of starts when I was uh, when I graduated high school in 1980. So so you don't have to do the math. I'm 56. Um, when I graduated, my grandparents decided for my graduation to take me on a trip out west. I grew up in West Tennessee, and so that was quite an experience to go all the way to California and back. It took us about three weeks. We were on <laughs> with a group of senior citizens on a tour bus, so it was an experience that I never forgot, but one that um, gave me a love for travel. I mean, I had studied all of these places in school but to see them in person, there's no way a photo can do those places justice. So if you've ever been outside your hometown, you realize that this world is a beautiful place and it's, it's, it's different than the pictures show you in the books. So it gave me a real passion for travel. But then I got home and I went to school, went to college and got the degree. and. When I first went to school, I didn't know what a computer was, except in science fiction. So I dropped out of school, went back to school, eventually got the degree. And then I started working in corporate. And I worked for General Electric and for the American Chemical Society and some other places. And I learned a lot about computer programming. We didn't have websites back then, so I didn't do a lot of web stuff. But I did learn a lot about computer programming. And then, in, um, 1992, I turned 30, and I heard the biological tick of that clock and thought, okay, I need to have some kids if I'm going to do that, and so I got pregnant, and I didn't know anything about kids. I thought, you know, you have a baby, you stay home for a couple of weeks, you put them in daycare, you go back to work, and that's that. Well, my life was turned upside down, not only because I didn't know which end to put the diaper on, but also because he was very sick. And so it was very hard for me to return to work. However, I did it, and I thought, you know, I was driving an hour each way, and it, I was miserable. I cried every day, and that was also the same time they had the bombing in Kansas City at the daycare, and I was, I was, I was living a life of misery and fear. And I wanted to stay home so bad I couldn't stand it. So I got some part-time jobs, and I did everything I could to pay off all the bills, and I finally got to stay home the day my second child was born in 1995. And there's my three lovely children, and this is one of them sitting here, so that's her in the middle there. Um, it's, it's been a while ago. So I got to stay home with them. We moved to a 300-acre farm in the middle of Princeton, Kentucky, which is the middle of nowhere, basically. Um, I did a lot of uh, part-time jobs. I did some teaching. I did a lot of things to just keep staying home with them. I started homeschooling the three of them and just found some part-time teaching jobs in between to get to keep staying home. However, as they got older, I decided to get back into the computer business. And this little video here is the story that sort of changed my life. I hope you can, whoops, hang on. I hope you can hear it. Let me see if I can get it pulled up. Many years ago, after I graduated from business school, can you hear it? I decided to take a vacation. I chose a small, quiet fishing village where I thought I'd be able to take my mind off of business, if only for a few days. Walking along the beach just before sunset, I saw a small fishing boat coming to shore. Inside the boat were lone fishermen and several beautiful yellow fountain. How long did it take you to catch those fish, I asked. Only a couple of hours, he replied. Why don't you stay out a bit longer and catch more, I asked. Certain that there must be a demand for more fish than the few I saw in the boat. The fisherman smiled. I catch enough to support my family and I live a full and busy life. I rise with the sun, fish a little, play with my daughters, have lunch with my family, and then teach children how to fish before I stroll into the village each evening where I sip wine and play guitar with my wife and friends. Listen, I said, I have an MBA. 
I can help you vastly expand your business. If you would simply spend more time fishing, you would soon earn enough money to buy a bigger boat. Really, questioned the fisherman. Absolutely. And with a bigger boat, you'd soon catch enough fish to buy several boats, then a whole fleet. At that point, you'd be big enough to sell your fish directly to a processor, cutting out the middleman and greatly increasing your profits. The fisherman raised an eyebrow. Hmm. Eventually, you could open your own cannery and control the product, the processing, and the distribution, I added. Then what, he asked. Well, you then relocate your operations to the capital. And if all goes well, you'd likely find yourself in New York City and control of a rapidly expanding empire. How long would all of this take, he asked, clearly following my logic. Oh, probably between 10 and 15 years, I replied. And then what? Well, that's the best part. You would announce an IPO and sell stock to the public. At that point, my friend, you would be very, very rich. A millionaire many times over. The fisherman paused. Uh-oh. Sorry about that. Let's see if we can't get it back. Really? A millionaire? Then what? What do you mean? I answered a bit surprised. I mean, what would I do if I were a millionaire? What kind of question is that? Whatever you like, of course. I imagine you retire. Move to a small coastal fishing village where you would rise with the sun, fish a little, play with your granddaughters, have lunch with your family, and then teach children how to fish before strolling into the village each evening where you'd sip wine and play guitar with your wife and friends. <laughs> The fisherman smiled, and without saying another word, began to build a small fire. We shared a taste of the delicious fish and watched the sun go down over the ocean as the sound of guitars rose from the village nearby. So that little story changed my life. I didn't, still on. Um, I realized that what, what is life about if it's not family? And for me, that was the most important thing, was to find a way to stay home with my kids. Even after uh, you know, they got older and homeschooling was working for us and I, I wanted to stay home with them. So I decided that it was time for me to figure out how to do that and make some money so that enough money to provide for us on a daily basis. So back then, <laughs> The web was just coming out. I don't know how many of you remember front page, um, but that's how I started. I started with front page, which then I would study the code since I was a coder and would look to see, okay, well, what's it doing and why is it doing it? But the only thing it created really was HTML, <laughs> if y'all are familiar with that. Um, so I taught myself HTML, PHP, and MySQL and I started building some websites on the side for some of my friends and family. It was mostly just a hobby, and I sort of just was playing around with it to have something to do besides just talk to kids. <laughs> and back then, about the only way I could network, being out in the middle of nowhere, was with Yahoo Groups. Anybody remember Yahoo Groups? That was about the only way we had to communicate. There was no Facebook. Um, so then I started getting serious about it around 2003. And that's when WordPress came out, and I looked at it, and I thought, well, this is just a blog. I, this is not a website tool. But I got familiar with it a little bit, and I played around with it. However, I was still using HTML and those kind of things. And over time, that's when I started freelancing. And so over time, I never forgot, number one, the traveling, and I never forgot how it felt to want to stay home and work and not be able to. And those two things, I think, have influenced everything I've done since then. So now I am still a self-employed freelancer, and I do a lot of custom work for people. I also have a business where I have interns and web developers who work with me, and they build websites. I'm not a designer by any stretch of the imagination. I'm a coder. I'm a programmer. So if I have websites to build, I hire other people to build them. I also hire a lot of interns from colleges to help me out because I also found 
that a lot of people get out of school like I did. It was easy for me to find a job when I got out of school. There were not a lot of computer scientists back then. But nowadays, there are so many that they can't find jobs easily without having five to 10 years experience. And so I've interned a lot of college kids that are just getting out of school and need to have that experience. So I teach them programming, but also teach them WordPress and Laravel's the frame, other framework we use. I also have several subcontractors. I have some that develop websites. I have some that are programmers. Um, and I also teach classes. I teach WordPress classes for beginners, for people who don't have enough money to pay for a website, but they want to learn WordPress and they want to build their own. So I, I do that now. I also am a speaker, of course, and I am a traveler. And this is my home, full time. I live in a 30-foot RV with my wife who's sitting over here. And this is our office on any given day. We travel 365 days a year, and we go to some pretty amazing places. Um, and we've been doing that for two years, so 2016 was when we started. So a lot, these are a lot of the questions that we get asked as we travel around the world and um, stay in different places, and people say, what do you do? And I say, well, we run a business, and a lot of people in the RV community say, well, how do you make money and do this full time? And so I explain that we have a business building websites and custom development and all kinds of hosting and domains and other computer related stuff. But they, the, one of the first questions we get is, well, how do you do that? What's your home base? And if it were up to us, we probably wouldn't have a home base because we just like to go wherever we want to go. But the government says we need one. <laughs> so to get a bank account, anymore. That's the first question they ask you is what's your physical address? And if you don't have a physical address, they don't look at that very well. So to get a bank account and to get our driver's license and to get the license on the truck and the camper, we have to have a physical address. So since South Dakota, Florida, and Texas, and I believe Tennessee, they don't have income tax. So those are usually the states that RVers are from because it's much cheaper to live in one of those states, especially since you're not there a lot of the time. We first chose South Dakota, which was nice, and for our physical address, they let you choose the campground. You have to stay in the campground at least a week, I think it was, and then you can call that home. So that's what we did for South Dakota. However, South Dakota gets really cold. <laughs> and, and we left South Dakota. We love visiting there, but we don't go back that often. We don't have a real reason to go back that often. So we now choose Florida because it's warmer in Florida, and we go there every year for winter, so, um, or have for the last two years. We've gone to Orlando because um, we have a conference down there that, that my wife speaks at, and so we end up there anyway, and so that's why we choose Florida. Um, and for Florida, it was a little trickier getting our license because um, you need a physical home address. And what we finally had to do was to get the truck and the camper licensed with the license plate, and then they can use the address on that license plate, which it's a little tricky. You have to put the cart before the horse. We got the license plate, which, had to be, which gets the county name as the address. And once you have that, they, I guess they think we live in our car. So they, they, they use that as our physical address. So you don't own a house in Florida? I do not own a house you in Florida. Florida. I don't own a house anywhere. You don't, like, a little bit of campground in Florida or anything like that. As far as Florida's concerned, your truck and your RV is, is my your address. Mm -hmm. okay. Address on the driver's license is the license plate number. For real? For real. Are you sure? I thought it was yeah. the county. No. Okay. License. I shows you how much I've looked at my. <clears throat> so that's our physical address. I think it's one Clay County, Florida. I mean, you know, um, we have um, people say, how do you get mail if you don't have an address? Well, we, we use a mail forwarding service. We used one in South Dakota called um, Dakota Post. And they were okay. 
And now we use one called SBI or St. Brendan's Isle. They do a lot of mail for um, RVers, but also for people who live on boats. There's quite a few in Florida that live on boats and just travel that way all the time. Um, and it, it, you know, there's a cost to it. I think it's $100. Well, they take $100 and then you use the postage, and when it's up, it's up. And I think it's $20 a month for the service itself. And then you pay them postage and they take it out until it's gone, and then they replenish it with a credit card. Um, but basically, we, we get our mail there at that address, and then every so often when I need mail, I just go tell them where I'm at, and they forward it to me. Do you have a question? I was going to have you elaborate. Oh, yeah. So, so when I, get, when I see that there's enough mail in there that it warrants the postage for it, then I just say, okay, I'm staying at this campground this week, or this is where I'll be by the time the mail gets there, and they'll forward it to me. So do they send you like, notification about like, how much mail you have, or do you have to do that? That's a good question. I, I, they scan my mail. They scan the envelopes. Right, that's an extra add-on. They will just forward your, you can set it up several different ways. They can forward it every week. And you just go in and tell them where you're going to be that week. Or you can set up an address, say forward it here until I change it. So however you want to do it, they're pretty flexible with setting it up the way you want it. I pay the little extra to get my mail scanned. I get the envelope scanned. And then if I want them to scan the inside for like a dollar a page, they'll scan what's in it. And I don't have to wait for it to get to me. However, most of the mail I get in there, thank goodness, are checks. And so when I've got enough checks in there that I'm like, okay, it's worth me getting the mail, then I say, okay, I'm going to be, and it usually, ta depending on where I am in the country, I have to figure out how long it's going to take me to get that mail. And it's usually, right now we're, we're parked in Alabama, and so it takes about two days, three maybe. So I just have to time it well because we move fairly quickly usually and so we don't stay many places longer than a week. So I have to figure out where are we going to be next week, you know. So it's a little tricky and we've had, <laughs> here's a tip, always use priority mail. <laughs> always because you get a tracking number. We sat in, in Page, Arizona for two or three, well about a week extra because we were waiting on the mail to get there because they had lost it. We never did get it. We finally left, and it showed up two or three weeks later. They had sent it back to the mail forwarding service and then back to us. So now we never not use priority mail. Um, so the mail's been an interesting thing for us. It's, it's been a lot of fun figuring that out. Oh, excuse me. Yes, no, go ahead. The mail forwarding service doesn't act as an address for you. It acts as our mailing address. So I really have a physical address. It's just like having a P.O. box. Okay. And banks do not like the forwarding service. So when I put that in as my address at the bank, they say that's a personal mailbox. That's, not, that's like having a UPS box or something. They won't let me use that address. So to get a bank account is a little trickier. There's, there's another similar service down there. We live on a boat. Ah. But there's another one down in Florida that, that they are set up where the, where the banks and things will actually accept it as your physical address. Oh, cool. And I don't remember which one it is. I'm sorry. We use, an, we use a UPS store. And we've never had an issue at all. But we're with a bank that accommodates travelers. Oh, well, I'd, so I'd like to talk to you about USA that bank USA later. That's cool because um, the banks, we've not had luck with banks either, so I'll get to that in a minute. Um, Voting is another, it wasn't a problem in South Dakota. They let us use the campground and so the voter registration card was fairly easy. Um, and I thought it was gonna be that easy with Florida. Usually the, the mail forwarding services will take care of all that for you. I mean, it's a cost, but they do it for you. But um, I, we just got a notice from the mail service we use that uh, somebody in Florida is trying to say that if you don't have a physical address, then you can't vote and all that stuff. So they're going through a lot of legal stuff with that. And the good thing about the mail forwarding services is they fight a lot of those battles for us. So they, they don't want to lose their service. So they want to keep you voting um, and keep their customers happy. I use uh, mobile deposit for checks. And um, I'll get to banks in a minute. but. Um, 
we've had some trouble with that too. Some banks are not as um, technically up to date as others and mobile deposits can be a problem if you're not with a bank that does that well. Um, so I do use mobile deposit and I currently use Capital One. Okay, so what do we do specifically from the road is we build WordPress websites. Like I said, my wife builds a lot of websites, but I also hire subcontractors to build, do the pretty stuff. I don't do the pretty. And then I build custom plugins and a lot of custom work for a lot of designers that I know. And I, we also, well, there's the custom development. I also do hosting, which is an easy thing to do from the road. Um, I mean, I don't have the servers in the RV. I, I resell this, or I have a hosting guy who keeps the servers for me. Um, I also, like I said, I teach a lot. I do some training. I use a lot of um, video chat and that kind of thing to train and educate. I do a lot of debugging for designers who don't want to know code or don't like code, um, so they'll call me. I do a lot of support for clients and designers. And we do some edits for some of our clients. And we have about 100 to 200 clients that we take care of while we're on the road. I also sell domains. So we do pretty much a big array of things. And like I said, I've been doing this for, I don't know how many years, since 2003. So we've sort of built a lot of things. So here's our team at the moment. <coughs> Two of them are here with me. Of course, here's my daughter here and my wife. Um, that's me in the middle. This, this is the baby that was sick that I stayed home for at the bottom. His name is Matthew. Uh, the guy over here was one of my interns from Austin P. And he and I worked so well together that I just hired him. And so now he's my, one of my best programmers. And the lady at the top I met at a networking event in Kentucky. And she and I got along. And now she's my project manager. And, um, I did not set out to build a business. I wanted to be a freelancer and I wanted to just make enough money to get by. But I also like having time to explore when <laughs> we're somewhere so it's easier for me to offload that work to other people and let them do the work. And that helps them too because now they get paid and we get paid. Um, so it works for me. I still am not crazy about having a business. That's not my goal. I don't necessarily want that responsibility. However, um, I do like having time. And I like helping these people get jobs. So this is how my team and I and my clients communicate. So we use, obviously, email and Slack. How many of you know what Slack is? It's uh, like an, a messenger thing, a communications tool. Um, which we really like. Zoom, anybody know what Zoom is? It's a video chat service, and you can have you know one to hundreds of people on it. We use that a lot for classes, and for um, clients, and contractors. I use it for everything. Um, and no matter where we are, as long as we can get internet, then we, we can use these tools. Um, obviously, we text each other. We use the phone sometimes, depending on the cell service where we're at. And we do get in person every once in a while. Since we're traveling, I can sometimes land where they're at. And we also use a ticketing system called Teamwork um, for our clients to contact us and to leave us messages. How we stay connected to the internet. This is probably the biggest question we get is how do you keep an internet connection? I have this Verizon hotspot which uh, has unlimited data, and the bill is only 50 something a month. However, I had to pay a lot to get the little SIM card because they're, they no longer let you have unlimited data. Um, but you can find it on eBay if you know what to look for. Um, so that helps us out in tight spots. We still try to keep that low because Verizon is, um, you know, we hear rumors every day that Verizon's going to stop doing that. They're going to cut those out. Um, but it's worked pretty good for us. We don't use it a lot because in the east, Verizon doesn't pick up well. Now in the west, we use it a lot. But in the east, and we've been at the east for quite a while now, um, it doesn't work as well as AT&T. So our phones have a 30 gig plan that we use. Um, 
And these, you know, we can um, use these as a hot spot for the computer. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> and we also have an AT&T home base, which is made for um, a, a landline um, that you can get for, your, for people who live in rural areas. Um, they sometimes will use it for a landline if they can't get regular service, I guess. I'm not really sure why, but they had a special going on. I get 500 gigabytes of data. But it is network managed, so if we're in a larger city, it's usually really slow and doesn't help us out much. But if we're in a rural area, then we can usually get pretty good speeds, assuming there's a good AT&T signal. So we very heavily depend on AT&T and Verizon for our internet. Occasionally, we can, if we're in a campground, they might have Wi-Fi, but we have to be really careful as to what time <laughs> because when everybody's on the TV at the same time, it, goes, it gets really slow. Most campgrounds are not really good with internet. Now we do not stay, I don't think we've ever stayed in a KOA or one of the big commercial campgrounds. They're, in our opinion, they're overpriced and it's not worth it. We don't go for um, the pool and the kids stuff that's usually in a KOA. So, we, usually, we, we find our best, the best places we enjoy are the state parks. They show us more of the area, more of the culture, more of the landscape. It's it just, that's what we enjoy. They're usually built around something like water or something that stands out. So we like the state parks or city parks. There are a lot of good city parks too. Or national parks, obviously. The national parks are harder to get into. You have to reserve way ahead of time. So we haven't stayed in a lot of those. But some campgrounds have good Wi-Fi, some. We do not count on that because most don't. And when everything else fails, we find the nearest truck stops. Truck stops are good places for internet, usually. So we haven't had to do that very often. The internet, the first time I went out wet, well, in the 80s, of course, there was no internet. But when I went the next time with my son, it was like once in a blue moon you'd find somewhere with the internet. So we would try to use the phone for GPS, but it just wasn't happening, you know, was get out of the city. And now, we, there are rarely places that don't have something. It may not be very fast, it may not be very good. It, well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but truck stops are usually pretty good. And if all else fails and we can't find internet, we just say, heck with it, we're gonna go on a hike, or we're gonna go biking, or we're gonna go do something fun. And they're, usually we're staying close to something that's got water or a place to go biking or something for fun. And we enjoy doing that anyway. And I'm a self-proclaimed workaholic. I enjoy what I do. And so it takes sometimes for the internet to go completely out for me to get away and go play. And to keep up with all of this, there is a mobile RV group on uh, the internet and on Facebook that we follow all the time and they tell us what plans, what mobile plans are out there and they update it constantly. So there's always good information out there. And I keep up with all the little deals that come across, you know, when Verizon has a good plan or this one has a good plan and sometimes you find um, a good deal where they don't realize it's such a good deal and so then they'll cut it out but if you're already in contract then you get to stay on it so that's that's pretty much how I got the 500 gigabytes they don't offer that anymore and they only offered it for a very short period of time and then they realized oh my gosh what did we just do you know so when all the RVers started calling them they shut it down <laughs> so this is how we find contractors we use a company called FreeUp has anybody heard of that um, it's sort of like Upworks, anybody heard of that one? Except I've found a lot better quality contractors there because they pre-vet them and I don't have to. I don't have to interview, I mean I still interview them, but they check them out first and so they find out if they're um, good quality before they send them my way. I can just, yes, there's three E's in it. So when you go look it up, make sure you put the three E's in it. Um, pretty much I tell them I want a programmer who knows PHP and MySQL 
and I want them to work this many hours a week and you know this could be full time it could be just for three weeks I tell them everything I want and within 24 hours they've got me at least one to three contacts and I interview them um, I get to choose a price range as to how much I want to pay for that and uh, pretty much location if they have to be US based I've found as someone else mentioned this weekend um, Philippines is the best place to get programmers and developers because they're inexpensive but they have the best worth work ethic of any of the foreigners that I've worked with so much better than the India groups that you can get and much better than them and I hate to say this but sometimes much better than the US workers their work ethic is awesome and they're really good to work with and I've, I've found them to be some of my best contractors um, unless you find a good one like I found with Todd as an intern we also use social media to get some of our contractors um, if I need someone to work I just usually put out a message to my friends and I'll get referrals and we also do a lot of networking as we travel we haven't done it as much as I'd like but I want to start going to more WordPress meetups we've got several word camps on our next couple of months we're going to be stopping at and um, so we do a, quite a bit of networking we go to a lot of conferences and things um, and then I have con training courses and one of the reasons I do the training which is really selfish but I like working with people I've trained <laughs> and so a lot of the um, web implementers I work with it's really hit or miss as to whether they really know what they're doing or not and so I like training them on WordPress and that way they know what I expect and I know what to expect from them and if they do a good job then I can refer clients to them or hire them myself um, that seems to work the best for me if I train them plus I just like training and teaching and helping um, I do hire interns still from uh, Austin P where I graduated I, my my professor's still there he's now the Dean of the college which is hard to believe is because that's been a long time ago um, but he still sends me interns I'll get two to three every semester and that's a hit or miss sometimes they're good and sometimes they're not so good but um. and then I do use Upwork occasionally but I've not had very much luck there so the tools we use, we use an accounting software. I personally use FreshBooks. I know there's a Quicken or QuickBooks and a lot of other things. FreshBooks has worked best for me because it allows me to do all those things. I can do invoicing and I can do recurring invoicing and I can uh, put all of our expenses in there. We can get all the reports from there. It makes it very easy at tax time. Mallory just pulls the reports and I take them to the accountant and um, it's pretty much done. For customer relationships, um, we pretty much keep that in FreshBooks as well. We don't, we're trying to expand and make that better because I'm not real happy with what they do, but um, for now that's what we're using. We also use LastPass to keep up with all our passwords because we have a lot and that lets us share them with the people we want to share them with without having to remember them or having to make ABC123 as the password all the time. We use uh, project management software. We went through several. We used Trello for a while. I mean, if you're familiar with Trello, that worked well for us in some areas, but it did not work well with um, keeping up with time. So how much time is the contractor spending and how much do I need to build the clients and how much do I need to pay the contractors? So we now use Active Collab, Active Collab, Active Collab something like that, which keeps up with the um, time on the contractors it also keeps up with the invoicing however I don't like how they do invoicing so I still use fresh books for that but we put the invoice first there and then I move it to fresh books um, but it keeps up with the projects it keeps up with who's doing what it keeps up with the task list so it's currently working okay for us we've been through several we also use infinite WP everybody anybody familiar with that or manage WP is another one it lets us monitor and manage several WordPress websites at the same time. 
So we can go in once a day and click update and it updates all the WordPress sites at once instead of having to go into each one and update all of them. So we use, Mallory uses that every day, I think, um, to do the updates. Any questions so far on any of those tools? How we find clients? Well, we go to networking events like this one. We go to retreats and campgrounds. We found several that would just park somewhere and people say, so what do you guys do? You travel all the time, how do you know that? And we'll say, well, we build websites. Oh, I need a website. I mean, it's that easy. So just, just campgrounds. I mean, we run into all kinds of people. Um, and a lot of them, another reason I like to do the training, a lot of them, I've found that not only is it women who want to stay at home or college graduates who can't get jobs, but there's a whole group of RVers out there who want to find a way to do it full time. And, or they may be doing it full time and just don't have as much income coming in. So teaching has become one of our biggest income goals here. We also go to a lot of conferences. We go to some mental health conferences and we speak there and um, that's another area that we're trying to hit because there are a lot of people with mental health issues that either can't, ha can't find a job or they're afraid they'll lose their job because of their diagnosis and so they're, they want to find ways to um, make money and thank God for WordPress. I mean, I am so thankful that it's a way for people who don't know anything about code to start a career and build websites. That's just, if I'd had that back when I, my kids were born, I would have been a happy camper. So, but most of our business does come from word of mouth. We've been doing this for so long that most people know what we do, or most of our friends do, and so we get a lot of referrals and a lot of word of mouth business, especially on social media. That's our tool of choice nowadays, Facebook usually, because that's how we keep up with friends and family, and everybody that we work with is pretty much on social media. I used to get a lot of business on Craigslist, but not so much anymore. It's changed a lot. and. Um, I just, it's not as good use of my time. But everywhere we go, we're talking websites and talking about what we do and talking about who we are and um, it just seems to come up in the conversation, which is not such a bad thing because it makes most everything we do tax deductible. So how we get paid? I get paid through PayPal. A lot of my clients prefer PayPal. My goal is to meet them where they're at. If they want to pay by PayPal, then I'll take PayPal. If they want to pay by a uh, credit card, then I take Stripe. If they want to pay by a check, then I'll take a check. However they want to pay me, I'm pretty much going to take it. Um, but I have PayPal and Stripe, and my uh, FreshBooks uses WePay. I don't know if you've heard of that one, but it, it just it's like the others. And I have daily settlements. I don't know if you're aware of these, but if you have any of those processors, you can set them up on daily settlements so I don't have to go in and withdraw money. It automatically puts the money from my PayPal account or my Stripe account into my bank account every day. Now, I think it takes two days to get there, but every day it's, it does what it calls a settlement and anything I've paid out comes out and anything that has come in comes in, it settles it and it sends it to my bank account which makes it really easy. I don't have to mess with it. And then we do take checks, and I talked about how we get those. And then I use mobile deposit to deposit them in the bank. Time management can be a big thing if you work from home. I know the lady that spoke before me talked a lot about her time. Uh, a big thing for us is time zones. We've parked in some places where the time from the back of the camper to the front of the camper changes. Or we have a picture where she's holding her phone and I'm holding my phone and they both have different times on them. And when we were in Arizona, they even have the um, Indian reservation time in the middle of that. So we had one time at the beginning of the camper, one time here, but then if you wanted to go to an Indian reservation event, then it was a totally different time. So time zones have become a big deal for us and we have to constantly be aware of which time zone we're in and which time zone clients are in and which time zone subcontractors are in. It can get pretty tricky. <coughs> so
some days when we travel, I have to work in the truck, and, which is not really a big deal, but it's just, it's just a self-discipline thing. It's much easier to watch everything as we go by. But you have to manage your time, so you, and it's more, I don't think you can manage time, you manage yourself. And so for me, I'm having to constantly make myself do the work on the days I'd rather be looking out the window or playing. Um, but we, so we try to set aside some days that we just go exploring. We'll say, okay, there's one day this week, we're just gonna go somewhere and visit a state park or whatever so that we can not be so distracted on those days we're supposed to be working. It helps me to set up routines, and as many people have mentioned this weekend, to have those processes in place so that I can have those days to go exploring and to do the things we want to do. Um, some of the tools I use to, to keep up with the time are, we talked about the Active Colab for the project management, but I also use Todoist. I don't know if y'all are familiar with that one, but that's a great personal task list manager for me to keep up with all those recurring tasks and all the projects that I personally need to keep up with, keep up with contractor stuff. Um, and my rule of thumb is when I get a new task in to run it through this and if it can be eliminated, get rid of it. And if it can be automated, do that so that then it becomes a recurring task. And if it can be delegated, do that. That was a hard one for me to learn because delegating my stuff was the one of the best things and the hardest things I've ever had to do. If it can be procrastinated or put off till later, do that. You don't have to do everything right now. That was another hard one for me to learn. And then if all else fails, then concentrate on it. Get it done, get it out the door, send it on. So that takes a lot of self-motivation some days when you're in a pretty place and a lot of self-discipline to get the work done. Um, Money management. So I heard from Nathan, I think it was in Atlanta, he told me about the book Profit First. How many of you have read that book? That's an awesome book, and I suggest you read it if you haven't. And it talks about putting your profit first, and I was very guilty of not making a profit because I left it to last. And so now putting that first has really helped. And bank accounts, I first had an account with Simple. How many of you have heard of Simple? It's, it's, a, it's an online bank that I really liked, but as soon as they found out I lived in an RV, they said, that's it, and they cut me off. They would not do business with me at all. I didn't, I didn't even dream they would do that. So I, I be, I'm very careful about who I tell that I'm in an RV full time anymore because um, I need to have a bank account. So now we use Capital One. I've been very, very pleased with them. They, they've been really good about us moving around um, the, we had a local bank and still have a local bank wh where we lived last in Kentucky, but the problem has been that every, every time we move, they want us to call them and tell them where we're at so they don't think somebody's stolen our card and it's fraud and it's too much trouble. We don't, I don't want to have to call them every time we move. We move every week, so that's not feasible for us. So um, Capital One has been very good to, to, to to let us move wherever we want to, but to also sort of keep things in check. And they, you know, they call me every once in a while and say, did you make this payment? And I'll say yes, and so, you know, it's all cool, but um, it can get tricky, so. And we have an accountant who's still in Kentucky, but he can take, keep up with us wherever we go, thank goodness, and he's been really good to work with us no matter where we are. And of course, the fresh books I talked about with the, uh, health insurance has been a real, sticky one for us because um, we don't have any and we're so we're pretty much self-insured thank goodness we're both healthy and we rarely go to the doctor we um, but I haven't had health insurance in years and it's not been that big a deal now it's it's a big deal at tax time because I have to pay the fee but the fee is still cheaper for me than getting health insurance because the health insurance wants fourteen fifteen hundred dollars a month to cover both of us and my penalty is 1400 a month or so. So, I mean, a year, at the end of the year. So it's cheaper for me to just pay the penalty. And I don't think this is really right, but when I go to the doctor and I tell them this is self-pay, that price comes way down. So it's cheaper because our, our deductible, if we get insurance, is like seven or 8000 Well, if we don't go to the doctor but once a year, it's really not worth it for us. So we don't have insurance. And,
Good. Good. Yeah, because I do the same thing. Yeah. It's just so expensive that it's like. It's, it's not realistic. Ask, ask them for the, what's the over the counter price. It's like 100 bucks. And I'm like, okay, that's way better. <laughs> so I, I'm right there with you. Yeah. It's crazy. It's worth it to me. I, I would much rather have my freedom than to go get a job just to have health insurance. Yeah. I do keep the um, pay 45 bucks a month for the catastrophe just in case like anything really bad happens. But other than that, I'm, I do the same thing as you do. Yeah. I've got yeah. full insurance and I do that too. I still shop around the cash price first. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, like I said before, much of our lifestyle is tax, tax deductible since everywhere we go we're marketing and everywhere we go we're selling websites and everywhere we go we're meeting with a client, then a lot of it can be tax deductible. So um, it definitely helps us at tax time except for the health care. The legal, I'm just going to breeze through this, they've talked about legal all weekend. Um, we do have some contracts. I usually make the clients come up with the contracts if they want them. Uh, we don't have any um, regular lawyers, but we would like to find one. I am a sole proprietor. I don't have a business entity. I tried that route and I didn't like all the fees that came with it. And like I said, I'm not really trying to build a business. I'm j I just want to be a sole proprietor and um, that works for us. Uh, so my advice is to give more value than you're paid for and don't tick people off. <laughs> so they won't sue you, probably. If you're good people and you work with good people, then you don't have to worry about it as much. I, am, I base my life on no fear. I'm not going to live in fear. And if, that, if I'm afraid of those kind of things, I'm not going to do my best work. So the question I keep asking myself is how much am I willing to lose and what do I need to protect? and then I go do that. So if I need protection for those, then I get that kind of protection with a lawyer. So how much does it cost us to do this? We spend almost exactly the same amount of money we did when we rented a house. Our campground fees and the RV payment replaces a rent we were paying, pretty much right on the money. And then our truck fuel, which is probably what we spend the most on, and the propane, they replaced the utility bills that we had in a house. So it's pretty much a wash. It doesn't cost us any more or any less to live in an RV as it did to live in a rented house. So here are some of the pros and cons, and you can decide whether it's a pro or a con to you. For me, I like to be my own boss. I don't like people telling me what to do. That also becomes a big responsibility if I'm the boss. I have to make the decisions, which I also don't like to do. I get a lot of time freedom. I love going to Walmart when everybody else is out of there or to the grocery store when there's nobody there. I get to decide when I work and when I don't. I also have some financial freedom. Nobody tells me what my salary is except me. I get to decide how much money we're going to make or whether we're going to sit and enjoy it or whether we're going to try to build a business or not. Um, you do have to work alone, but I like working alone. I'm an introvert and I like that kind of world. Some people don't, but um, we get out when we get tired of it. We can work from wherever we want. That can be a good thing or a bad thing, especially if there's not an internet. We get to set our own prices. We get to choose who we work with. We get uh, taxes. That's a con. I don't even think, I, I can't think of a pro with that one. <laughs> Benefits. I don't have the benefits that I would get if I worked for a company, but do I need them? I have enough benefits otherwise that I don't really miss the vacation. I can take a vacation whenever I want to, so I'm not really worried about benefits. You do get to work in your pajamas, however, I don't um, because I like getting dressed in the morning and I feel like I'm doing my better work. So there is lower overhead. So I have a lot of these things that I'm not going to get to. You just told me I had two minutes. So here's some of the things we've learned about travel. I'll just let you read those. I do have the slides up on SlideShare, and I also have them up on my website, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, so that's the thing, some of the things we've learned about travel. 
I think I talked about most of these. And I think most everybody's covered most of these this weekend, so I'm just going to sort of slide through them. Does anybody have any questions while I'm doing this? How do we find them on the slide screen? Um, it's under C.G. Cullen. I have my, that's my Twitter, but it's also most everywhere else. But if you'll go, let me go to the end here and you'll see the, yep. There is the page I made for this word camp. All right, any other questions? I'll be, I'll be here for a little while if anybody has questions. Yeah. Yeah. That's All right, we're going to go back to Fort Payne for a little while. She's working a temporary job there for a little, for a little bit, mentoring. Um, and then we're going to Florida for the winter. Orlando. There's a city. Gotcha.